Good morning. Welcome to church today. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Uh, I want to invite you to stand if you are able and join us in giving our hearts, giving our minds, giving all of who we are today as we enter into uh, the presence of the Lord. We believe that he is present wherever we are uh, already, uh, but uh, we ask that the Lord would make us especially aware of his presence today. We're going to begin with a call to worship from Psalm 66, led by Teresa. If you want to read with me or just listen, it's up to you. Um, shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing, the, um, sing to the glory of his name. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds, how great is your power. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. You want to sing with us now? King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty.
return to heaven we'd spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped out from glory to wear my sin. Thank you. 
pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time to gather, to praise your name, to sing of your story, to give you the praise that you are due. We turn our hearts and our minds once again to you, to the incredible way that you rose from the grave. Unleash this new kind of life in the world. Help us experience that life in a very real way. Today, tomorrow, in this time that we're in, help us to share that life with uh, those around us. God, once again, we take a moment to pray for deliverance from this uh, time that we are in, from this pandemic. We pray that you would, in your power and in your might, remove this virus from this earth. Heal our land. We turn to you as the only one who can do anything about our true situation. We pray for those who are on the front lines of battling this virus. We pray for our doctors, our nurses, healthcare workers, staff, just those who are caring for the vulnerable of our city. I pray for our friends at the mission, the drop-in center. I pray a uh, blessing for them. Thank you for providing for them. Pray for continued provision for what they need. Thank you for the gift of our, um, our school system opening up uh, the high school for a place to be, a safe place to be. We pray for protection as well. God, thank you for this time. We close this time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, First Baptist. It's Sarah Lane, Director of Family Ministries, and today I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for fulfilling our mission, cultivating a community that invites all people to experience the empowering love of Jesus Christ. Through your prayers, your time, the goods that you give, and your financial giving, you empower our church and our community with the love of Christ. Thank you. It seems that during this time, as we're worshiping outside the walls of the church and all across Whatcom County, our love has only expanded. Already, our Bridge of Hope Fund has been able to buy groceries and pay bills and help people get through this time. This week, I'd like to encourage you to continue to give to this fund. Maybe we find resources we didn't know we had, or maybe we're getting a stimulus check that we can share, or maybe it's not the time for us to give, and that's okay too. But we can pray about this and decide what works best for us. Today, as we pray our generosity liturgy, let's consider the Bridge of Hope Fund. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given me, all I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. 
To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches that chokes the word, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Well, in this season of Easter, as Christians continue to celebrate and to reflect on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the only person ever to do it uh, in the way that Jesus did it, uh, as we reflect on what that means for us in this time of global crisis, I, for one, have been freshly struck by what we see in the scriptures post-resurrection. Uh, people, what we see is people had different emotional reactions to the fact that Jesus was alive again. Resurrection was not an all-of-a-sudden kind of moment for all of Jesus' disciples. They didn't just automatically get it. Uh, the gospel writer John tells us that one of his disciples, uh, one of the disciples, Thomas, doubted that it really happened, even though all his uh, friends were telling him the truth. Slide, Michael. Tom, next. Yep, next slide. There we go. Thomas had, had to come to the realization for himself. Matthew tells us at the end of his gospel that when his disciples met Jesus on the mountain in Galilee, quote, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Luke tells us that Jesus shows up to two of his followers as they were walking away from Jerusalem. Their hopes dashed because it didn't seem like Jesus was who they'd hoped he would be. I have talked with a number of people this week, and I have seen this kind of broad range of emotional reactions to the Easter that we experienced this year as well. Some people were deeply moved by uh, the profoundness of what it means that Jesus is still alive, Jesus is still able to bring life out of death, light out of darkness, uh, in the midst of social isolation and distance. Uh, some people were just sad that Easter wasn't what it usually is in its traditions and practices, and all and every emotion in between those two as well. So as we, as a church, move forward into this Easter season, uh, I would like for us, I want us to think together as a church about what it means to thrive in this kind of moment. Jesus shows up to his disciples in John 20, where they were isolated in fear and anxiety. They were afraid of what the future might hold for them. But Jesus shows up to them in the midst of their fear and anxiety. And the first thing that he says to them is, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace is this Hebrew concept of shalom. Shalom is this great word to communicate wholeness, to communicate fullness, to communicate a sense of flourishing, a sense of thriving. Jesus invites his disciples to experience peace in the midst of their uncertainty. For us today, I want us to think about what does it look like to experience his peace in the midst of such social crisis? What does it look like to thrive in the midst of the times that we are in? That word thrive means to prosper or to flourish. And that's what life in the kingdom of heaven is all about, flourishing, flourishing as human beings, flourishing in what it means to be a human being. A couple of years ago, as a church, we took the whole year to talk about 
how the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, how that whole sermon is Jesus' vision for what human flourishing looks like. When something flourishes, right, it grows or it develops in a healthy way. And I know for me, for my own self during this time, I want to grow in a healthy way during this time. I do not want to miss out on what this time could mean for growth in my own life. I don't want to waste this time grumbling or griping or just simply waiting for everything to go back to normal, quote unquote. We don't know exactly when that is, but the sense I'm getting is that it might be longer than we want and normal is not going to be normal anymore. I believe that this time can be a time where we can thrive in our personal lives, in our spiritual lives, in our relationships with others, and in our life together as a church. The beauty of Easter is that the power of God is always working, even when we don't always see it or feel it. So I want to share what's been helpful to me over the last couple of years. I want to and what I'm still learning, what I'm still continuing to grow in uh, day by day. To thrive in such times of crisis is to respect the full humanity of ourselves and one another. To respect the full humanity of ourselves and one another. We Way back on page one of the Bible, Genesis Chapter 1, verse 27, we see that God makes human beings as whole people, made in his image. Part of what that means is that we are multifaceted persons. All right, next slide. We see that we are, there is a social dimension to being a human being. We were made to be in relationship with one another. That's why the future of the church is not going to be all online. We were made to be in community with each other, embodying Christ to each other, representing Christ to each other, serving as priests to each other. So we were made as social beings. We're also made as intellectual beings. There's an intellectual dimension to our humanity where we think deeply about who God is. We think deeply about who we are. This is where theology and doctrine and apologetics come into play for us. There is a spiritual dimension to our humanity as well, where we think deeply about who, wait, where we think deeply about how we were designed to commune with God, to be in relationship with God, to experience loving union with Christ. We do that through prayer. We do that through the practice of sacred scripture reading called Lectio Divina. We do that through things like devotionals and Bible studies, those kinds of things. We tend to our spiritual lives. There's a spiritual dimension to our humanity. We also have a physical dimension to our humanity as well. One of the things Easter proves is that Matter matters. N.T. Wright has said that. The physicality of this earth, the physicality of our bodies, it matters. What we do with our bodies matter. What we do with this creation matters. The stuff of this earth, the physicality of our bodies is important. So Jesus, God, calls us to holiness. holiness. He calls us to modesty. He calls us to careful stewardship of our bodies and other bodies as well. So there's a physical dimension to our humanity as well. And finally, there's an emotional dimension to us as human beings. And this is the area that I want us to invite the empowering love of Jesus Christ into over the next few weeks. When that emotional dimension of our humanity is unhealthy or when it is ignored, great damage can be inflicted in our relationship with God, in our relationship with others, and our relationship with ourselves. 
our teacher in all this, thanks, Micah, is, of course, the ultimate human being, Jesus of Nazareth. The one whom we believe rose from the dead. And if Jesus really rose from the dead, then it means that everything Jesus said and did before he was dead has real meaning, has real authority for our lives. So let's just take a, take a look at his life. Matthew 26, verse 36. We see Jesus on the night he was betrayed. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. We read, Jesus said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Did you hear that? Sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Here he is in the garden of Gethsemane. He is overwhelmed with so much sadness that it feels like he is going to die. Feels like he's going to die from the weight of the sadness before he even makes it to the cross the next day. He feels, he is feeling the moment of suffering and pain in his circumstances, and he names it for what it is. We go to Mark chapter 6, verse 30. There we see Jesus has just sent out his 12 disciples. He has sent them out to evangelize. He sent them out to heal the sick, to cast out demons. They come back and Mark tells us that, quote, they gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus is tired, exhausted from serving so many people. And what does he do? He acknowledges that he needs rest. He just needs some time away. Turn on over to Luke chapter 7, another instance. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. There we see Jesus is walking through a town and he happens upon a funeral procession taking place. And so Luke writes, as Jesus approached the town, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. That was it. His heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. <laughs> the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Here, Jesus empathizes with this woman. This woman has already lost her husband. She's a widow. And now she's lost her only son. Jesus' heart went out to her. He empathizes with the pain of this woman. Because in those days, she would have been now destitute. She would have had no way to support herself with her husband and her son being gone. Jesus feels for her pain. And out of great love for her, he raises her son back to life. A few scenes later, in chapter 10 of Luke, here, Jesus has just sent out 72 of his followers, and they come back all ecstatic about how even the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. And we read in verse 21 of chapter 10, at that time, Jesus, here it is, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. I mean, Jesus is talking about like God is pleased with this uh, ministry that has been going on. Jesus experiences these feelings of utter joy, full of joy, at seeing his disciples thrive in their ministry. 
Later on, Jesus will pray for us, pray for the world to have the joy that has been in him all this time. So he's a joy-filled person. In the book of John, chapter 2, we come across Jesus entering the temple at the time of Passover. He looks around. He sees all what's going on. So John writes in chapter 2, verse 14, in the temple courts, Jesus found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and other and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So Jesus made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Man, this is... This is Jesus angry here. We, we usually skip this story over in kids' Sunday school. But here is Jesus full of anger, anger, almost even rage. He's angry at the injustice that he sees going on right in the temple courts. People taking advantage of other people. The rich getting rich off the backs of the poor. Jesus is full of anger. And then, over in John chapter 11, John, Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus, and he goes to the tomb. Mary and Martha come out to Jesus. They scold Jesus for not being there when they needed him most. And Mary just starts weeping. And so John writes, When Jesus saw her weeping... And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then shortest verse in all the Bible, verse 36, Jesus wept. Jesus grieves with those he loves. He is deeply troubled at the carnage Death has inflicted on the world. Right after that verse of Jesus weeping, those around him, the Jews around him said, see how he loved him. They could see the love that Jesus had for his friends. Jesus is not some Spock-type person, emotionless and cold. No, he was a human being, an emotional human being. He modeled the perfect integration of emotional health and spiritual maturity, which is faith and trust in his Father. He was emotionally healthy because he was spiritually healthy. He was spiritually mature because he was emotionally mature. Often what I see in how people deal with their fears, what I, what I often do, uh, experience in my own heart when I'm dealing with my own fears, with my own anger, joys, frustrations. Uh, sometimes people deal with all of those things in one of three ways or often a mix of one of the three or a mix of all three. Uh, one way that people often deal with their feelings, with their emotions is by trying not to get too attached to them, especially with pain and suffering. They work to let go or transcend or rise above the feelings. This is an Eastern spirituality, like that of Buddhism, for example. Very Jedi Knight-like, where you detach, you remove yourself from pain as much as possible, from any kind of emotion as much as possible. Uh, a second way that people deal with their emotions is not the Eastern mindset, but a Western mindset, even in Christianity, where there's this undercurrent that says emotions are dangerous, they need to be suppressed, emotions are not part of the way that God works in our lives. Instead, what this approach emphasizes is that Jesus is alive, Jesus is victorious, and therefore I have victory, I should not feel this quote-unquote bad emotion, 
or call it anger or call it sadness or call it depression because that would make me, quote, a bad Christian and just reveal a lack of faith in my life. There's this undercurrent in Christianity that just tries to overcome that way. This approach denies what we're feeling or it suppresses what we really feel and just tries to move on. Uh, this, th in this view, it, it would be like seeing Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus and all the faith-filled people around him saying, oh man, that's really too bad. I, I really thought Jesus was a stronger believer than that. Doesn't he have any trust in his father? That's the second way that we see people deal with emotions. A third way that I see people deal with their emotions is more of a uh, secular way, more of what we often see in our world. It's through distraction. Uh, they distract themselves to the point where they do not have to feel the weight of their emotions. They often say, yeah, there's, there's evil and suffering in the world, but what's on Netflix tonight? Or where are we going out to eat tonight? Or, or where are we getting takeout tonight? Or they just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling on their social media feed. Now, there are positive elements in each of those approaches. I'm not denying that at all. The way that our Whatcom County community has come around each other in this time of crisis has been really amazing to see. The people making masks, taking food, serving others, cheering on health care workers, first responders, staying home. It's amazing to see, and I am very glad to be part of such a community. But the main thing that each of these three approaches to pain, suffering, emotions, feelings, the main thing that each of these have in common is the tendency to run away from emotional pain. It's, it's either avoided or denied or pushed to the side or it's absorbed in drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever. Eventually, though, emotional unhealthiness catches up to you. And you could have a nervous breakdown, you could get divorced, you could have an affair, you could just quit. It catches up with us sooner or later. In Jesus, we see a better way. Jesus shows up to his disciples in their fear, in their anxiety, after the resurrection. And he says to them, peace be with you. He offers them a way to thrive in the midst of all the emotions that we experience in times of crisis and uncertainty. Now, when I say thrive, I'm not talking about just putting on a happy face when things are tough. I have a friend going through a very tough time in his life right now, and to tell him to just be joyful or just be happy is not appropriate at this time in his life. It's more emotionally healthy to name the rawness of the feelings and to enter into them. So I've given my friend permission uh, with a non-judgmental attitude, a non-judgmental approach to just call me anytime he needs to, day or night, to vent. And however that comes out, I've told him, is just fine. He needs to enter in to the rawness of the feelings. In fact, Jesus once said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who grieve for the way things are when you know they are not as they should be. For they will be comforted. That's the next slide, by the way. So, in this series... I'm going to be drawing much on the work of a pastor uh, from New York City named Pete Scazzaro. Pete Scazzaro. <clears throat> uh, his story is pretty uh, intense. He was pastoring a vibrant, exciting church in New York City when one day his wife came up to him and said, I'm quitting. I'm quitting your church. It's not worth being there. She couldn't take it anymore. He was a workaholic. He was passive-aggressive. He was insecure, he was an angry leader, he neglected his wife and kids all while his church was growing, and all in the name of doing big things for God. So he makes the claim in his book that it is impossible 
to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. He writes, for some reason, the vast majority of Christians today live as if the two concepts, emotional maturity and spiritual maturity, we live as if the two concepts have no intersection. Our standards of what it means to be spiritual totally bypass many glaring inconsistencies. So we have learned to accept that, for example, you can be a dynamic, gifted speaker for God in public and be an unloving spouse and parent at home. You can function as a church board member or pastor and be unteachable, insecure, and defensive. You can memorize entire books of the New Testament and still be unaware of your depression and anger and even displacing it on other people. You can fast and pray a half day a week for years as a spiritual discipline and still be constantly critical of others, justifying it as discernment. You can pray for deliverance from the demonic realm when in reality you are simply avoiding conflict, repeating an unhealthy pattern of behavior traced back to the home in which you grew up. And we could go on and on with story after story of people whose outer life did not match up with their inner life. So this is a personal journey for me as well. Uh, 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, our lives <clears throat> were in such a place of upheaval and transition, uh, new baby, new job, horrific experiences in the new job, the new role of church leadership, and I just felt so out of control and the sad part is that it was my family that got the brunt of those out-of-control emotions. So much so that it really scared me. So much so that it really scared my wife. And so I got into therapy then and have been on a journey of emotional health ever since. Still learning, still on the journey, uh, and by no means have arrived anywhere close to what even I wish I was. But I, I saw what, what I thought, what I thought I was, quote, spiritually mature on the outside. Inside, something was radically wrong. There was no peace. There was no thriving. There was no flourishing in the midst of crisis. So over the next few weeks, we are going to take Jesus up on his offer. On his John 20 offer, his offer of peace being with us, we're going to give Jesus our feelings, we're going to give Jesus our desires, we're going to give Jesus our trust, knowing that he knows what to do with us, and he knows how to help us be more like him, who was the, emo the most emotionally healthy person ever to live. So that's kind of where we're headed over the next few weeks. I look forward to growing and journeying with you in the process. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Jesus, as we take a moment to respond, as we take a moment to uh, hear for ourselves the invitation for peace, for shalom, for flourishing, for thriving in the midst of times of uncertainty, fear, anxiety. God, we pray that you would um, speak to us, that we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might um, give you our feelings, we might give you our desires, we might give you uh, our trust in this time, in this journey together. We're going to need a lot of grace for each other in this journey as we work through uh, a lot of what's underneath the surface, and I pray that you would fill us with grace and patience along the way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue to respond with a time of communion, 
We remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, and he blessed it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. So I want to invite you to take a moment and grab whatever elements you might be able to use symbolically to symbolize the bread, to symbolize the cup, and to remember that Jesus gave his life for you, all of who he was, his entire humanity, his emotions, his desires, he gave them to his heavenly father in trust. So take those elements as you are ready, and we're just going to respond and close with this word of prayer that the, that the Lord would do his work in us. So let's respond together. See you. 
Hey, thanks so much for joining, uh, joining with us today. We bless you, and we pray that you would have a very blessed week. Uh, let us know how we can pray for each other. Uh, leave some comments or greetings or, um, you know, goodbyes in the, in the comment section, and just let everybody know that you were, you're here. So God bless you. Amen.